Great. Well, today I welcome John Evans from Lithium Americas to our Coastal Front studio. John joined Lithium Americas with an impressive resume, including roles as COO of Diversitech Corporation of Atlanta, Georgia, Executive Vice President and Global Head of Supply Chain Operations for Arista Life Science. And he was also the Vice President and General Manager for the Lithium Products Division of FMC Corp. John first had acted as an independent director for Lithium Americas in 2007 and then pivoted to the President and CEO in 2018. During that time, the company's market cap has moved from a small $422 million to over $3 billion today, and that's in US dollars. And the share price has moved from $4.77 to $26, a 445% return since he's been at the helm of the ship. Lithium Americas is a Canadian-based company incorporated in 2007. It's listed on both the Toronto Stock Exchange and New York Stock Exchange under the ticker symbol LAC. With headquarters here in Vancouver, John and his team are walking distance from our studio. From the latest iPhones to growing EV market, lithium is a hot commodity that does not seem to be slowing down. In today's episode, we're going to discuss the current supply and demand issues impacting the industry, the environmental impact of lithium mining, and how Lithium Americas is tackling both these challenges. John, thanks for being on the show today. Thanks. Glad to be here. Great. So we are going to first talk about Lithium Americas to give everybody, the, all our listeners, a bit of an introduction as to the company. And maybe you could talk more globally about the lithium industry just to give sort of set this um, set the stage for our conversation about the demands of lithium and the environmental impact of lithium mining. So let's start with the company LAC. OK, so we're a, a advanced developer. I'll call ourselves. I don't think we consider ourselves a junior anymore. Uh, we have two uh, large projects, one in Argentina, which uh, the audience might be familiar with in Cachariola Rose, which is in northwest Argentina. And that project is finishing up construction, commissioning next year, and we'll get into production in, uh, in the latter half of 2022. And it's a, the largest lithium uh, production asset that's coming online in, in decades. Um, and then the other project we have is Thacker Pass, which is 100% uh, owned by us in, in Nevada. And it's the largest known lithium resource in North America. And the last resource and reserve update we did, it's somewhere like number four in the world. Wow. Uh, that's an unconventional asset in terms of it's the lithium is in a, uh, we'll call it a sedimentary deposit. Essentially, it's the sediment that was at the bottom of an ancient uh, volcanic caldera. And uh, the asset in Argentina is more traditional. It's a brine-based resource. Um, so we're, we're moving ahead on both. Uh, the Thacker Pass project um, actually just got uh, the, the air permit from the state issued Monday. And we expect to have the water and uh, mining reclamation permits by uh, by the end of next week. And we're in the midst, of course, of an appeal on the federal permit, which uh, initially when that came out, that's a huge milestone. It's the only lithium project that's been permitted on federal land in the U.S. in more than 60 years. The appeal is pretty much expected. That always happens. But uh, uh, and we're very confident, so is the Department of Justice, that there's there's no grounds there. So expect to have that clear by by the end of the first quarter next year. So wow. exciting That's, times. That is exciting. That's a good intro for the company. Let's talk more globally about lithium. Since your projects are both in Nevada, United States, as well as in Argentina, are those the two main countries in the world that mine lithium? Where, like, where if I wanted to kind of put a pin on, a, on, a, on the map of the top five places in the world where I find lithium resources, are those two the top five? Uh, no, actually. So lithium is not rare. You can find it in seawater. You know, what's more rare is finding a deposit that uh, is uh, that has the economics to be developed and be competitive in the marketplace. So today, okay. Australia is the biggest source with uh, rock-based spodumene uh, from a brine resource, Chile, to a lesser extent, Argentina. Those are sort of your three main producers, which are sort of rounded out by by China uh, as uh, as main lithium producers. The the U.S produces about 4,000 tons of lithium salts a year from brine, which is minuscule. Um, Canada is not even on the map. So U.S. and Canada actually are, are blessed with lithium resources, as are some other parts of the world as well. Um, the industry has grown very, very rapidly uh, from when I left it before, and, and that's where you're starting to see a lot of interest underlined sort of by the whole, I'll say, politics of where we're at right now and, and also the uh, supply chain issues that we're we're going through right now where people want to have supply chains which are shorter, more sustainable, uh, better footprint in, in terms of life cycle analysis where you're, as the markets develop like North America, Europe, and so forth, they want uh, the whole supply chains in one place. Okay. You mentioned Australia being the biggest market. Is it 
are there any major lithium mines like behemoth mines that really supply that are currently producing that supply a big part of the uh, uh, sure uh, yeah the biggest are, are, are going to be the green bushes which is a a mine in uh, uh, western uh, uh, Australia which is the largest spodumene uh, mine operating in the world okay and then in Chile uh, the Atacama uh, which is the driest place on earth but also is really blessed with Lithium, I'll call it the Saudi Arabia of lithium. That's where SQM and Album Merrill operate uh, primary facilities. So I would say those two are by far the biggest and have the biggest impact. Okay, and these are producing operations right now. Yeah, for decades. Yeah. Decades. Okay, gotcha. How far back has lithium mining been happening for in a kind of major way? In a major way, uh, I'd say the last twenty years. Okay, uh, but lithium goes back, geez, back to the you know late nineteenth century used in glass and fritz, uh, was involved in the um, uh, development of uh, atomic weapons, uh, the hydrogen bomb. Um, so it's, uh, it's involved in, in greases that you use in machines. It's a whole variety of industrial mm. processes. Batteries didn't really come on the scene in a small way until 1991 with Sony. Uh, and since then, it's, it's exploded. And uh, is it fair to say that almost all electric vehicles today, EVs, as we'll often be talking through this podcast, are uh, powered by lithium batteries? That's the, the chemistry for That's, sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. John, maybe can we just pivot for a second to have you talk about, like, why is lithium such an important product in producing batteries? It, like, if you on a, a sort of more chemistry basis. Yeah, sure. It's, it's, it's where it's positioned on the periodic table. I mean, it's uh, it's mother nature. It has the highest electrochemical potential uh, of any element. So it, you know, it sits in the alkaline uh, metals line and, and you'll hear other battery chemistries, which uh, are in that group, if you will, like a sodium battery and so forth. But lithium, due to that high electrochemical potential, it's, it's, it's never mother nature wise it just can't be matched so mm -hmm. and it's, it's it's a small molecule uh so the batteries are light uh and they're high performance okay so it's uh, it's just you can't replicate it okay well actually could, that kind of i guess answers another question i wanted to ask you which is is there any potential for another f type of battery to come along and, and disrupt the lithium market for for vehicles and for uh, phones and so forth i i, I find it hard uh just because of the, the 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 weight, you know, the amount of energy density you can have in a lithium battery, uh, because of course the heavier the battery in a car or truck, you know, that kind of defeats the purpose. Yeah. Uh, when you look at things like stationary power, uh, weight and size don't matter as much. So uh, folks have experimented with molten sulfur batteries, uh, with other types of chemistries that I can have a huge box like a sea container somewhere, and and perhaps I can utilize that. But even there, uh, you know, lithium is is made its inroads just because of its performance. Yeah, I think it'll be tough in vehicles and in uh, portable devices, well, because of uh, safety. So for cars, you know, the average life of a car is like 11, 12 years, uh, and it's already in. It's already been tested. You already put it in your pocket every day in your cell phone. Um, switching to another technology takes a long time. Our governments sure. do a lot of studying on safety and so forth. Uh, I don't think they want to have another you know, Ford Pinto uh, in the U.S. in the <laughs> early 70s. So I, I think that's a real challenge yeah. uh, where I, I think you'll see derivations of lithium chemistry where you've heard a lot about solid state batteries. So solid state is a solid yeah. lithium metal anode, um, which is kind of akin to what you had in those throwaway triple A's we talked about, double yeah. A batteries. Uh, and you don't have any... Um, uh, uh, you basically uh, don't have any electrolyte. So electrolyte is, is flammable when you talk about battery fires and so forth. You remove all that and you have a ceramic separator between the anode and the cathode. It allows the batteries to be smaller, have a higher energy density. That's the next generation where you, you might be able to almost double the energy yeah. density and you can pack these cells closer together and, and you'll have more range in your car. Yeah, and that's sure. if people, companies like Solid Power, uh, QuantumScape in the US, that's what they're working on. Yeah. Now you've been getting a little technical with the the whole uh, reference to brine, and I think you mentioned another format of of mine. Spodumene. Yes. Spodumene. Okay. Can you for the just to dumb this down for us non technical people, what does that mean? So spodumene or spodumene basically is traditional mining where lithium is uh, contained in an underlying or a rock. Um, you have to uh, find the material. You have to crush the material, concentrate the material, and then. Typically what happens today, almost in all cases, is that, that raw material, almost like iron ore for steel, is shipped to China uh, for the most part. And then it goes through an industrial process where it's exposed to high heat to change the 
uh, crystal composition of the of the rock uh, to allow the lithium to be leached out, usually by an acid or could be in some cases an alkaline, uh, to make an intermediate and then convert it to a lithium salt that is used in a battery. Brine's a little different. So brine is uh, usually in fairly arid areas, uh, an ancient salar that was fed by some volcanic activity. Uh, it's a very high saline uh, water uh, that's pumped that has high lithium content in it. Traditionally, you use solar evaporation to drive off the underlying water to concentrate the lithium up to somewhere between 1% to 4% in the underlying solution. And then you run it through a purification facility where uh, you convert it to a, to a lithium salt at the end of the day. So much different methods. Uh, one's more I'll call liquid mining, and the other is more what you'd be akin to for digging holes in the ground and that kind of stuff. Okay, that's helpful. When you have high concentration of lithium on its own, what does it look like? What does it feel like? What color is it? You can't see it. Oh, you can't see it? No. No, the, the, if you looked at the brine, it would, uh, it would just look like, like water. That's really? uh, much more okay. uh, salty than anything you'd find in the ocean, you know, akin to like the Dead Sea. Yeah. Uh, spodumene would look like a piece of granite. Okay. What, what are considered to be high levels of concentration when you're trying to, when you're dr drilling high? I know you're past the junior stage for Lithium Americas today, but when you look at the original drilling that your company was doing, obviously part of your share price isn't just because you're the CEO, it's you've actually had some good <laughs> drill results early on. What what does a good drill result look like? What's a high good a good concentration level considered to be? Well, they're expressed in different uh, units, so it's it's a little bit harder to go apples to apples, but okay. apples to oranges, if you will, for a, for a lithium brine, they measure it in parts per million or, or milligrams per liter. Uh, it's somewhere north of 600 parts per million, which I'll compare that. That's our deposit. It's very, very good. And it's also compared to what Livent has. If you go to the Atacama, which there's nothing else like it in the world, their, their concentrations are around 1,500 parts per million. Wow. Okay. Um, Spodumene is expressed in... Um, lithium oxide, and that's usually a really good deposit, like the green bushes is like 4%. Um, and then some of the other ones that have come on, I'd say relatively quickly during the first run up are in the one and a half percent, two percent range. Um, our deposits, like I mentioned, 600 to 700 parts per million in Argentina for the brine, and then sedimentary deposits is a little bit different. We, we express that in parts per million as well. Uh, if you look at Thacker Pass on average, it's about 2,300 parts per million. Lithium. Okay. So I'm going I'm to just quickly reference uh, Canaccord Genuity's latest research report by Katie LaChapelle. Uh, this was published on October 7th, 2021. Uh, they had a target price on your stock at $35 Canadian, which is almost at now. So when this was published, the stock was at t just over $25 a share. It's trading at $32.30 uh, today. And it's a target price of $35 with a, a buy, speculative buy rating. Um, Katie references in her sort of update, this is related to the Thacker Pash project update, saying, This morning, Lithium America has provided a series of updates on its Thacker Pass lithium clay project in Nevada, including an updated mineral resource <laughs> estimate. Overall, we view the update as positive. Project and permitting timelines were maintained, and management indicated that the discussions with potential partners and customers are advancing well. The project remains on track to start early works construction in the first half of 2022. Um, so just a quick question about that one comment about partners and customers. So when you're a lithium producer like yourselves, do you is there an intermediary between yourself and the end purchaser that's creating these batteries like a Tesla? Or do you work directly with a company like Tesla as an example? Typically, the battery companies would work directly with a lithium company because okay. it's a it's kind of a bespoke thing where uh, they try to tend to have two or three different suppliers but quality that's another aspect of this it's not oft talked about where uh, impurities in the material that's supplied uh, they tune their cathode lines to be able to deal with those uh, and uh, it's usually it's a direct relationship okay um, does Tesla produce and manufacture their own batteries or do they outsource that well, Panasonic's their partner, so Panasonic, Panasonic does uh, pieces, uh, and it's it's Panasonic technology that's now been upgraded by by Tesla. So I would say, yes, Tesla is in the battery business, but uh, really in partnership with Panasonic, and now others in China, I think, with CATL. Right. Okay. In uh, the Canaccord research, it states that the Nevada project remains on track, as we mentioned, to the first half of 2022. Um, how much money is it going to take to get this up and running, in your view? 
Um, capital intensity is uh, is is high. I mean, I think uh, I'll, I'll, I'll reference our PS, PFS is six hundred million dollars for phase one. Um, obviously, what we've come out with in that announcement was our initial capacity is going to be higher now by a third. Uh, and I think what is challenging right now for us as well as you cost things is we're in this transitory uh, inflationary environment. I mean, uh, labor, steel. Uh, you think it's transitory? I think by next summer, things will look a lot different. Uh -huh. um, you know, this, the markets respond. Uh, and um, it depends what happens with the winter with COVID and so forth. But I think it's, uh, it's certainly this isn't going to represent the next two or three years. That's for yeah. sure. Um, despite your amazing share performance since you've been the CEO, the company still isn't actually earning a profit. No. Do you have an estimate on when uh, Lithium Americas will turn profitable? Uh, we'll start producing in the uh, latter uh, part of next year. So at that point, um, we'll, we'll start generating revenue based on our, our joint venture in, in Argentina. Uh, and then into 2022, then that starts to, uh, or 2023 rather, that starts to ramp up as we make more and more product. Thacker Pass, uh, under the current schedule, you start construction uh, second half of 2022 at some point. It's another two years before uh, you're ready to start that plant up. So that's more of a 2024 late event. So yeah, this business is a little like venture capital sure. to some degree. Yeah. Um, because the the demand here is, is uh, well, supply is chasing demand now. And I think that's going to be that way for, for several years. Um, there aren't enough companies in the space. And if you can look at the history of our projects, I knew about both of these projects when they were under different management in 2008, 2010, here we are more than a decade later, and one's about ready to come online in a year, and the other is close to starting construction. It, it, this represents how long it takes, right. probably a decade or more in some cases. That's a good point, John. Well, it's it's never bad for, I guess, a, any kind of mining company to be in a market where supply is chasing demand. Does it all, uh, help you at all in the sense of trying to get uh, buy-in from government level level of government like whether it's lo like i know in argentina there's a lot of local government uh that you got to yeah. work where, whereas maybe in the u.s it's maybe more federal does that help you at all in in the fact that uh do they see that the government's realizing that they need to be responsible here and be supportive of this kind of thing absolutely so okay. that's changed in a great great way so argentina is really looking for foreign direct investment and sees this as an opportunity to kind of change uh, the composition of how uh, hard currencies burn in, burn in the country, given they're really dependent on agriculture uh, and want to diversify their ind industry base and take advantage of the resources that they have. U.S., um, I think you can see that with the Biden policy that came out earlier this year, where it's pretty clear on industrial policy. You have semiconductors, you have batteries, you have critical minerals, and you have pharmaceuticals. It's called out. So it's the first time I've seen the U.S. have an industrial policy now that's backed up by um, climate change policy, and Europe actually already has it. So it's certainly changed uh, and brought the, uh, 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 the focus now on developing these domestic sources. Okay. One other question I have for you. I did notice on, our, on the uh, Canaccord research that they compare... The share price performance, again, put this in context for listeners, phenomenal share price performance. But it's interesting that LAC's share price performance is, is lagging behind what is called the Global X Lithium and Battery Tech ETF. I'm not sure if you're familiar with yeah, that Yeah, sure. One. Okay. Do you have any thoughts or comments as to why your guys' share price is uh, lagging behind that index? We took off uh, faster. So it depends what a 12 months that you look at. Fair enough. Um, versus I would call folks that are more junior than us that are mm -hmm. starting from a much lower base. Um, there's been so much interest in this now that's building more and more every single month uh, that um, just they, they've had yeah. a diff different period of time that, to compare. That's a good point of reference. I mean, as you're looking at it, you can move a chart yeah. another six months or a year, and then all of a sudden it looks very different. By the way, I noticed you're wearing an Aterix vest. Thanks for supporting a Vancouver-based oh, company. Best stuff. <laughs> it's a good brand. Okay, John, we are now going to jump to our two main topics. Uh, we've already kind of touched on the first one, which is demand for lithium, but I want to dive into this a little bit more on a more of a global basis. Um, I want you to talk to me a little bit more about you know, who's using lithium, how much is this market growing, and then we're going to finish off talking about the environmental impact of lithium mining and maybe dispel some of the myths out there. Uh, most people would be surprised at how intertwined lithium is in their everyday lives. So could you help us uh, and our listeners understand? I mean, we all know that EVs and Tesla and, yeah. and other EVs, we know that our iPhones and our Sam, I use a Samsung, are, are have powered by lithium batteries. But 
Where else is lithium used in a prominent way? Or is that just the two big markets, phones and cars? They're the ones that have been growing the most. But uh, as I think I referenced earlier, there, there's industrial uses for lithium as well, whether it be in um, uh, high performance greases, uh, whether it be used in you know spacecraft actually to remove carbon dioxide from uh, from the lunar module and from space uh, space vehicles, uh, it's used in glass and fritz, you know, like borosilica glass, things in your kitchenware. Uh, it's got a pretty broad spectrum just because it's a really unique element in terms of its properties. But certainly, uh, the biggest growth has been in in batteries. Starting off exactly what you said, it's been in in handhelds, personal uh, laptop computers. Uh, and now is morphed into um, into vehicles along with stationary batteries for uh, for renewables or for grid stability. Okay, so if we were to put this on a pie graph as far as like market demand, I mean, what what percentage would just say electric vehicles be as far as the current or proposed you know future demand of of lithium? Is it are we oh, talking like future demand? Yeah, it's going to be like 90 percent for oh, vehicles okay. for okay. transportation. Okay, uh, with, so it's the it's the lion's share by a country mile. It's yeah. a big big. Uh, to give you an example, I left the industry. Uh, I went to private equity actually in 2013. When I left, the industry was about 100 and I'll call it 150,000 tons. Uh, and it was this is looking, annual consumption of it, lithium, right. 150,000 yeah, tons. It's pretty small, actually. Okay. Uh, now moving at the end of this year will be uh, 500,000 tons or more. So it's actually grown quite a wow. bit from 13 to now on a, on a relative basis. Uh, and that growth has really been all through, um, through whether it be personal devices or vehicles. Vehicles is actually not all that big yet. Uh, it's really what's coming in the future where sure. today it's call it a quarter. You know, it's not all that big. It's still your iPhone, your laptop computer, yeah. power tools, all of that stuff. I mean, it's ubiquitous, right? Everything yeah. you pick up practically has a lithium ion battery in it. Um, you know, flashlights, everything. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so absolutely. It's, it, it's all over the place. The Energizer Bunny. Yeah. <laughs> Powered by lithium. Right, which is, uh, <laughs> those are primary batteries, so you throw those away. But yeah, yeah the, the, the anode or the uh, anode in that is pure lithium metal. Right, right. So I think I mentioned to you before, I drank the Kool-Aid a while ago. My wife has a Tesla. I've been fortunate enough to be able to get pick up one of the Porsche Taycans. So we're, nice. we're, we're, all, we're all electric over here in the Johns family. My question is uh, around the, the vehicle manufacturers. I'm shocked at how slow it is. It seems to me slow that these big auto dealers are um, converting their cars or launching new cars into the battery set, like into EVs, because it seems like the... Maybe this is your reference before about supply chasing demand, but it seems to me like there's like this infinite demand of people who want electric cars. I mean, the F-150 is the fastest, the highest selling mm -hmm. truck in North America for decades now. And of course, uh, Ford has just launched their, announced their F-150 Lightning, which is apparently the battery so big that if you have a power outage and you've got this you truck fully charged, you can reverse, un you take the power out of the truck and power your home for three days. Wild. So my question to you is, why do you think we're not seeing car manufacturers um, ex you know, expanding their fleet of, of EVs faster? You don't have the infrastructure to support it, even if they okay. wanted to. So oh. uh, you, you look at the investment. Uh, we were just chatting before we started on Ford and SK Innovation. So there's a partnership process in that the automotive companies want to make cars. So they're partnering up with battery companies. And then there's the capital investment to support that future growth, which in Ford's case, they just announced a $12 billion infrastructure investment in, in Tennessee and in Kentucky to support all this. LG and GM are doing the same thing. Volkswagen's doing the same thing. But you've got to retool your supply chains, um, fill up the pipeline, and then have the infrastructure to be able to deal with it. You're right. Um, and I think it's interesting because a lot of the companies that were sort of boring brands or whatever else, for the past, they've been very exciting cars because they look like cars that people want. And when they introduce a model, uh, it takes off. And I think that's been another surprise is that folks have, are keep now keep changing the uh, penetration level. It's going up as they're offering these models that uh, yeah. have the right uh, characteristics to them and the look to them and so forth. People are buying them. Europe, uh, the U.S. even now, which I think is, is a bit of a surprise for people. The other piece, though, is the infrastructure on charging. Uh, look at in, The electrification of our grid, exactly. so to speak. So, I mean, if you wanted to drive here to Calgary, it might get tough some of the along the way sure. right? have to find somewhere to plug in. I don't think you want to bring extension cord and sleep overnight somewhere. <laughs> um, but that has to change along with it as well. So there's a lot of pieces that have to come together where this becomes, you know, an easy switch for every type of driving habit somebody has. But yeah, I would say popularity, it, it resonates with people. Yeah, absolutely. 
Going back to uh, the su supply chain, you're at the very beginning of the supply chain of lithium batteries, and you mentioned that there's typically battery manufacturers that partner with the car company. So Panasonic's partnered with Tesla. That's new for me to know that. So when mining companies are close to production, I know they often will uh, um, uh, get into uh, supply agreements ahead of time, saying, "Look, we'll, we'll and, they, and that's in fact how they sometimes finance things. Is that something that Lithium Americas has been working on already, or do you have any commitments in place today where you have a certain amount of lithium that you're planning to supply to a particular customer? In the case of Argentina, most of the offtake for phase one is already spoken through, either through the equity interest in our partner, um, who is a lithium company who's supplying the Teslas. And who is that, support. sorry? Gangfen. Gangfen, okay, right. Um, and the other sponsor of the senior credit facility that we had uh, for the project, uh, Bankcheck, who's no longer a shareholder, but they're, they're the largest petroleum refiner in, in Thailand, and they're looking to move to be green. Uh, there's, a, there's a small remaining piece of about 9% that we'll place in the market. Um, in Thacker Pass, intentionally, we haven't signed up for any offtakes because What's changed over time is the interest in the company. Uh, we've made a lot of progress and also our, our balance sheet's quite strong. So we can be much more selective on how we'd like to structure, even in terms of what that looks like, um, how folks want to partner um, and at what part of the project they want to get involved in. Perhaps an OEM doesn't want to be involved in mineral extraction up front. I just want to partner with the conversion facility or something else. We have the, the financial wherewithal to be able to, to have those types of discussions and be a little bit more selective versus right. early on, you know, companies in any resource space. Um, you know, I came out of private equity. I'm used to managing balance sheets. That's what you're worried about. Yeah, sure. You know, cash burn. We're not so worried about that anymore. Now it's about making sure that it's the right uh, partner who can bring synergies or the right types of things of the relationship. It's good for the company. It's good for our shareholders. Yeah. Okay. From the data I've read, it looks like the uh, the estimated um, demand for lithium is going to triple. From, and this is 2021 by 2025. So in four years, it's going to triple. Does that sound right to you? Yeah, double, triple. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, about a million tons, maybe a little bit more. I mean, wow. the, 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 what we just talked about, it seems to be going up every single time somebody relooks at it. Yeah. Now, you mentioned earlier that um, your Argentina project is expected to start doing uh, getting into production in late 2022. Yep. And Thacker Pass is, did you say 2024? Did yeah, you say late 2024. 2024. Okay. Are there any other, uh, you know, I guess, peers to yourselves, competitors, and I don't know if you can't call them competitors when everybody's you know, chasing the, the demand. So is, are there any other companies out there that are close to converting from building out a lithium to mine to actually production? I can't think of any greenfield ones. Uh, certainly brownfield, there's been announced expansions in the Atacama. And just for our listeners to understand the difference between greenfield and brownfield? Uh, well, brownfield, it's already existing operation with a capacity expansion added okay. to it versus greenfield, which is you're starting Brand from scratch, okay. which is what both projects that we have. Yeah, uh, There are some brownfield expansions with the current producers, with Albemarle uh, and with SQM primarily, Tianchi, there's a few others. Yeah, um, But greenfield, we're the, we're the most advanced, that's for sure. Kachari is imminent. And then even at Thacker Pass, if you look at North America, there's nobody else that's closer. Okay. Um, do you guys have any, other than these two projects, do you have any other locations that you're currently doing drilling on that you're looking for either near these existing projects or in a completely other jurisdiction? So we have a pretty active uh, geo team uh, yeah. that prior to COVID was all over North and South America. During COVID, sort of relegated to North America. We uh, have a small interest in an uh, early stage company called Arena Minerals, which is in Argentina, which makes sense if we've built out this base of expertise in Latin America. And then in the U.S., uh, we're out snooping around. So we, we do do a lot of exploration, um, not necessarily to press into service next year or whatever else, but to find it sort of early stage before anyone else is really looking uh, and then to do the work on determining how to unlock the value. So we announced as part of our announcement that we're putting together a, uh, and, and launching an innovation center in Nevada. Part of that will have the entire uh, pilot line, if you will, of uh, the Thacker Pass process under one roof. But, but more than that, uh, it'll have the laboratory facilities and so forth for, able, for us to be able to not only optimize what we have, but also to characterize new things. So, John, I'm a bit of a techie guy. I like, I like tech-related stuff. I often watch the Boston Dynamics videos with that crazy-looking yellow dog they have and their <laughs> drones. And and I got a drone myself. I got a you know I, a lot of our staff now have these uh, electric scooters. I I often wonder if um, if we're all just underestimating the amount of demand needed for battery-related items out there. As this sort of everybody kind of moves this direction. 
And uh, wanted to get your th thoughts on that. Do you think that analysts that are, you know, whether it's Canaccord or other analysts that are estimating, I know that the Canaccord recently increased their uh, estimated pr cost of lithium because of the rising yeah. demand. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Maybe we'll start with that question. Yeah, I, I mean, you keep seeing the 2030 number go up. You know, at one point, it's like 1.7, one, one, one and a half billion, 1.7 billion, then 2 billion. Now I'm seeing numbers up to 2.5 billion. I mean, we all live untethered. Right, so I, you, yeah. it's like if you forget your phone, it's worse than your wallet. Um, <laughs> and then you talk about drones and everything else. I mean, all these things are portable power. Uh, and now we're talking about vehicles uh, and it's all these devices. So I, I do think uh, that uh, that number will be continued to be moved upward. In terms of price, um, lithium itself, I know it, the price has really gone up quite a bit, but you know, in comparison to things like nickel or cobalt, um, you know, and Tesla actually announced this today, they're going to lithium iron phosphate batteries because they're simpler, right? You have uh, iron and you have lithium. Lithium's not- Versus what previous to that? Uh, high nickel batteries. Okay. So high nickel batteries are the ones that, you know, they, they have they're high energy density, some of the bigger vehicles with longer range, but they're also the worst thing you want to see when you're a, a car manufacturer is a car catching on fire. And then of course the police, the fire department comes and they try to put it out with water, which is a no-no with lithium. Okay. Um, there's other technologies out there which are easier to manufacture. You don't give up much in terms of performance. Uh, and you, I think if you look at the car companies, they're trying to offer a portfolio that uh, has price points that everybody is interested in. Not everyone can afford 85 grand or 100 yeah. grand. Um, and they might not need the range either. I mean, driving to Vancouver, how many yeah. how many miles a day are you going to drive? 100 kilometers, maybe round trip. Really good point. Yeah. Uh, these these cars that like LFP, uh, which they really started in China, Sorry, LFP, lithium iron phosphate. Okay, yeah. um, and, and Dow Chemical has lithium iron manganese phosphate. It's a, a much easier chemistry and it's and inherently safer because it, it, uh, you don't have the thermal runaway with that. You can literally can puncture the battery of the, with a um, screwdriver and there's, you're not going to get an explosion or anything else. So okay. that's an important point because it kind of simplifies the supply chain. I don't have to worry about cobalt and the Congo and so forth. And nickel competes with steel. Uh, and lithium use, battery usage is a lot smaller. So you get a lot of price swings and in inflation with that, whereas lithium, uh, it, the supply chain for it, number one, you can use lithium carbonate, which is a far more stable salt and a little bit easier to make than lithium hydroxide. It's shelf stable and so forth. Um, and I think it'll help, I think Elon Musk already sees this. Number one, you can get the supply need, but also keep the pricing within, um, it's not quite as crazy as it is now where it's 20 or $30,000 a ton. I think the prices will remain higher, and we've always said more than twelve thousand dollars a ton because there has to be an efficient, sufficient capital return sure. on projects that literally every project you're going to see now. I don't care what any junior company you guys are covering says. Oh, it's a half a billion dollars. It's whatever. No, they're billion dollar projects. Hmm. Th that's another good question: is that you'll see different companies come in the space now because the current majors in the space are small. I used to work for one of them, um, and. FMC. Yeah. FMC, yeah. right. Even FMC today, if it was all together, I mean, were they a $5 billion company or something like that? It sounds like a big number, but it, to build these things, you know, it's a billion dollar project. Look what West Farmers is doing with SQ. It's a billion and a half dollars. Yeah, amazing. Uh, you, you, big ticket builds like this. And West huge. Farmers is a company that's done this kind of stuff before. Yeah. Uh, SQM has done it to some degree. Alvo Merrill, not really. They're a chemical company. Uh, you're going to see mining companies come in this space. You're going to yeah. see BHP and Rio. You're going to see perhaps a Dow Chemical or oil and gas because they know how to run large capital projects. They also have the balance sheets that can handle. I've got $2 billion, multi-billion Do you foresee a company like Tesla getting into this directly? Vertical supply chain, yeah. vertical integration, making sure they've got a supply line that's certain? They, they've announced it, but I think that's more done to maybe scare the industry a little bit to keep pricing down. Because if, if you're Elon Musk, what's your core competency? You, you want to make cars. So you yeah. need to... Well, I, wouldn't, I would argue maybe making cars isn't his core competency, well, well. but... <laughs> <laughs> and I'm an owner. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, it's, but it's uh, super cool because I get right. the fart mode on and it's uh, every time I turn a corner, my kids think it's really funny. Well, I, yeah. He's got to keep investing to make sure that moat doesn't keep shrinking, right? Yeah. So he needs to install capacity and you want to apply that capital to you know what they do is tesla versus do i want to spend three billion dollars to to buy that's yeah, a good know, point operation yeah if the demand continues to rise as quickly as it is and there's not a lot of it sounds like you're one of the only main greenfield operations to, that's going to come on board uh in the next year and a half yep. to two years um do you anticipate the current price of lithium to to double triple as well 
it could, but I don't think it'll permanently stay that way. Yeah. Um, I mean, folks are going to, the current majors have been um, uh, careful in that they got burned once before. You know, they saw what happened when you oversupply the market. It's not diff- no different than OPEC to some degree. Sure. Um, and they know the capital that they're going to have to deploy. So I think the current pricing now, it might come down a little bit in the long term. That's for sure. But it's going to stay at a much higher level permanently than it ever was in the past. When I was in the industry before, the average selling price was $5,000 a ton. Right, the last time it it, it and now you said it's thirty two thousand. It's twenty five thousand. Twenty five thousand. Yeah, twenty two to twenty five thousand dollars a ton. Wow. Now it ran up once before, but at an earlier stage. But uh, it bottomed out at sixty five hundred dollars a ton in the midst of COVID. Um, so fifteen hundred dollars a ton higher than what the average price was less than ten years earlier. Yeah, you'll see the same thing, but the bottom will be much higher. Yeah, the next time. Okay, good. John, this has been great. Let's now switch gears here. Love to use that term since sure. we're, well, there's no gears in EVs, I think. Uh, let's switch to environmental impact of uh, lithium mining. So I have three main questions. The first one for you is, do you have a view or an opinion on the net carbon footprint of an EV versus an ICE, which you guys refer to in your industry as an internal combustion engine vehicle? Right. So where I want to go with this is, if you look at from the manufacturing of, let's pick two cars. Let's take the Tesla Model 3 versus a Honda Civic, say as two examples. Kind of very popular cars. One's The first one's an EV, second one's an ICE. They both have the same need for you know tires and windshield wipers. All those things are the same. One needs to be supplied some pipes and whatnot, and then has to carry oil and gas for many years. The other has to have upfront cost of the lithium. So do you have any view on the difference between the two? What the Over the lifetime of those two vehicles yeah. coming off the lot, which one's going to have a bigger carbon footprint? The ICE is over the life of the car. And I think that was important to, to mention that uh, I said earlier, the average life of a car is about 11 or 12 years. Yeah. Um, when you look at, I think the Wall Street Journal did a pretty good article on this. Uh, as you start to drive, once you get to be about the 25,000 mile mark, from then onwards, the lithium ion battery power car or the lifetime is gonna have a, a lower carbon footprint. So agree up front, uh, it's more of a, uh, a parity or maybe in, in, slightly worse depending upon how sustainable the, the supply chain is. But over the life cycle of the car, uh, which people, I mean, the last car I traded in was nine years, uh, it, uh, it it's gonna be more beneficial for the environment. Okay. And then on top of that, because the other question you'll ask is, well, if I'm plugging into a coal-fired power plant, yes, I, I think in our countries at least that's a no-no now. So that is switching the composition of that as well. So that helps kind of accelerate on top of that the fact that I'm not using gas or oil or having to drill and all that other sort of stuff um, because I mean, that's the largest carbon emitter we have globally is is how we plug in. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think the Euro- European Union, uh, the U.S., Canada are already there. I mean, try to build a coal-fired power plant today. Yeah. And China's already announced as well. Offshore, they're not going to finance. Onshore, they're having a little trouble right now. Sure. Uh, but uh, long-term, that's where they're going to. Yeah. Well, that is a good uh, question. Thanks for leading into that. And when I look at Canada, and I'm not sure how you will know our country, but I'll just lay it out for you really simplistically. I'm sure you know this. BC, Manitoba, and Quebec are the three main provinces that generate almost 100% of their energy by uh, hydropower. Now, you could get really technical and say, well, Site C Dam here in British Columbia, to fill that dam, you've got uh, carbon release of all the trees that have been cut down to, in the valley. Like that, You can get really technical, right? Um, but ultimately, you are generating electricity from uh, zero, zero with zero emissions. So I know that when my wife or I plug in our car, we feel, you know, we feel good about our, our decision to buy these vehicles because not only are we not contributing to local air pollution, but we're also drawing our electricity from hydropower. So there's right. virtually, from start to finish, there's no emissions at all. By contrast, Alberta is largely you know, oil and gas fed. Uh, you get out to New Brunswick, small province, not very populated, but it's almost, uh, it's like something like 60, 70% coal fired plants. So is there, um, a, you know, if I was to put, be a devil's advocate, could I argue and say, well, EVs really don't mean much in the province of New Brunswick when, yeah, I might be not contributing to local air pollution directly, but then again, like, you know, 50 kilometers down the road is a coal fired plant that's actually generating the electricity to charge my car. What are your thoughts on that? I think, well, your government, I think, has 
try, try to get new permits to expand because uh, the grid requirements are going to expand as well, just given car companies, it, the longer you go, especially you're going to go back to your Ford dealership by 2035, you're not going to find an ICE car. Right. So it, that's going to continue to shrink down. And along with power plants, which look, we're going to have to expand the grid, build more power generating capacity because we're going to a more electricity society. I think New Brunswick and Calgary and other places are going to look for other ways because, frankly, your federal government nor the United States federal government are going to permit that anymore. Okay. So I think it's, it's not an immediate solution, but yeah. in the long term, it's the solution. Sure. But, but just to get right to that point, though, of like New Brunswick, am I really saving the environment if I'm charging my car from a coal-fired plant? I mean, like, is it? Oh, over the life cycle, for sure. Because like I said, after that 25,000 mile mark, that was assuming, you know, it was dirty power. Right. You're going you're gonna to have a positive impact on the environment. Right. Okay. That's a fair point. What about the recycling of lithium or the the management? Like, I mean, at some point, mm-hmm. I mean, we we haven't we're not really there yet because the first Teslas only came out when Edwin no. bought his first one. Like, nothing I mean, to recycle yet. Yeah, nothing to recycle yet. But like at some point, I'm assuming these batteries lose their value and their power, yes. and they can be recycled. They can. Yeah. So yeah. what does that look like? I think that's a ten to fifteen years down the road when you start retiring uh, these these vehicles you're going to have enough installed base of these to make it economical um, and I think as well you'll see some chemistry changes where perhaps lithium and we'll call it iron like L- LFP batteries become a big portion because when you open a battery up now cobalt nickels where you want to go after copper things like that I mean lithium actually even for the price spikes that we've seen recently it's cheaper to go out and actually just buy new lithium. Uh, that'll change, I think, when it makes enough sense for companies where they have a steady a supply. And I think you've seen it from Tesla, and you're going to see it for others. Well, they'll have a closed supply chain. You bring your car in, the battery's taken out. It's sent, just like lead-acid batteries. It took sure. a long time, but that's a closed system, which that's another point. It's like, well, we're going to have to dig all this lithium up forever. No, you won't. I, oil and gas, I have to, because I burn it, you and burn it turns it. into it's CO2 and methane and everything yeah. else. Uh, at some point, lithium is you're going to have a closed loop where, sure, you're going to have a little bit of new material that needs to come in because you can't recover everything. But maybe that's hmm. 20 or 30 years from now. Uh, but uh, it's still possible, you know, versus um, yeah. I mean, how much more oil sands are you going to get out of the Athabasca? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a really good point. John, to wrap this up, we're close to the end of 2021. You've got your Argentina project getting into production about this time next year, potentially. And then in 2023, 2024 for your Thack, Thacker Pass right. in, in Nevada. Um, do you want to speak to the audience about any other things that you, we could see upcoming here um, that you're kind of excited about that you can that you can speak about for Lithium Americas uh, to finish off 2021 or going into 2022? Sure. I, I, so obviously the, the focus is around execution for we have a lot on our plate uh, and an expectation not even so much from our investors, but actually from the industry that this material is going to be coming online. Um, we have announced, though, that uh, we're considering, actually not even considering, we're planning a phase two expansion already in Argentina, just given how big the asset is. Okay. Um, and also, there's so much interest and so much demand right now that uh, YD, YD Commission and uh, DMOB, all of the folks that we've had working on this, with all the interest in Argentina and other places, just Let's move on to the next phase uh, because we know we're going to need it. Uh, Thacker Pass, uh, similar there in that you have this massive resource update, which we'll continue to do exploration there in the areas that it makes sense. But at 14 million tons, uh, our original phase one's 40,000 tons. We're going to put together what engineering would look like to double that. These are massive projects. So more information will come out on that. Uh, obviously, near term, Kauchari, but uh, Thacker Pass, I think, given... People are concerned about life cycle analysis, footprints, and so forth. You kind of have China and, and Australia all in one place in northern Nevada. Uh, and I think that security and that uh, supply chain is something that, oh, I know, uh, OEMs and domestic folks that are investing billions in the U.S. are really interested in. They don't want to get this okay. stuff coming in from a ship that's come from three other countries first. Okay. Well, that's a good summary. Thank you, John. Last question for you. Are there any vehicles out there? I'm not a huge car guy, but maybe yeah. maybe you're a big car person. Are, are there any vehicles out there that you're really excited to see it convert to an EV so you can buy one yourself? Like, is there any one car you're like, I can't wait till this turns into an EV so I can drive this thing? I've been a BMW driver for a long time, so okay. uh, the X5 still isn't full electric yet. Yeah. It's, a, it's a, a hybrid, Yeah. but full EV would be great. Yeah. 
Awesome. Okay. Well, there's it's like having an M, you know, yeah. uh, in terms of acceleration. <laughs> so I would, oh, uh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. John Evans, president and CEO of Lithium Americas. Thanks for being on Coastal Front today. Really nice to meet you. And thanks for coming in. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Great. Thank you.